Welcome to another Revelation study. We are making our way through Jesus' message to the seven churches. You've got mail, the church is Thyatira. And uh, this is uh, the intolerably tolerant church. Uh, let me go ahead and read chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Thyatira, the next stop on our first century postal route. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to, to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you already have. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This is probably the least significant of the seven churches, but it's the longest letter. This was probably the smallest church that was addressed. And it just shows us that God is interested in churches of all size whether they be big or small or average, something in between. We could say this was a liberal church. Ephesus was the loveless church. Smyrna was the loyal church. Pergamum was the lax church. Thyatira, the liberal church. Our culture today embraces tolerance and pluralism. That means that all views are equal. Our culture worships at the shrine of open-mindedness. But how can there be such a thing as truth when everybody's opinions contradict one another? And how can contradictory opinions have the same value? Taking a stand today is seen as hate, and it's going to be increasingly worse as time goes on. The Christian doctrine is seen as discrimination. It seems like people would rather be in error than to be called intolerant. Our society really will tolerate anything but intolerance. It's fashionable today to seek the truth, but if you find it, it's unfashionable to tell other people about it. Adrian Rogers said, I've noticed that there's nothing as intolerant as the intolerance of the tolerant against the intolerance of the intolerant. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but there are some people who are going to be intolerant of you if you stand for the truth. If you choose to be intolerant of certain things, then people will be intolerant uh, against you. But we know that Christianity is narrow. Jesus said it was. And the cross is the only bridge from earth to heaven. So that is a narrow way. It's sad to say that much of the church is caving to their culture and allowing this intolerance uh, to creep in. So let's begin, as we always do, by looking at the city. We see in uh, verse 18, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, the Son of God here um, is going to speak to them in, in just a moment. But Thyatira was located about halfway between Pergamum and Sardis. It had been under rule, Roman rule for centuries. The city was thriving. It was a thriving commercial center. Its primary industries were wool and dye. 
Lydia was probably was from there. Uh, she probably started this church here. But you know, we know her as a seller of purple. But this city was known for its trade guilds. It was, so it was a blue collar uh, type town. And then we see the Christ in the second part of verse 18. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now, the Son of God is the title for deity. And remember we talked about in John in Revelation chapter 1, as John has this vision of Christ, uh, there's some things that describe him there, what he looked like. And Jesus uses that vision and applies himself to these churches here. And, and here he does that again. He says, the Son of God has eyes like a flame of fire, feet like fine brass. Now, whenever Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, his Jewish contemporaries immediately knew what he was claiming. They understood that he was making an unqualified claim to be God. But it's interesting that this is the only time this is uh, used of Jesus here in Revelation. But his eyes are like a flame of fire. Christ has penetrating scrutiny and he sees all things as they truly are. Something that he will demonstrate at the future judgment. His feet are like burnished bronze. The, the polished brass uh, feet may symbolize divine ju judgment. Uh, fire consumed sin offerings on the brazen altar. And then we come to the commendation in verse 19. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience, and that your last works are more than the first. So this was a good church. Christ was aware of all of these good things. They were a church that was laboring and loving and loyal and long-suffering. It was a good church. It was also a growing church. It was a church that was on the move. They had some spiritual momentum going. They were more for Christ now than they once were. And that's the direction we want to be heading in our churches. That's the way we want to be heading in our individual lives. We are more for Christ now than we were ever before. And it's sad to see Christians and churches growing colder as they get older. That ch this church, that wasn't the case. And you know, we all need encouragement from time to time. We need enough encouragement, as somebody said, to keep us on our feet and enough discouragement to keep us on our knees. And so a growing church will have opposition. Uh, Satan doesn't kick a dead horse. But there is a complaint, and we find the complaint that Jesus has in verses 20 through 23. Verse 20 says, But I have a few things against you. You permit that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, and eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, the King James there uses that word, notwithstanding. That's a, kind of a big word. I heard a story about a teacher who asked a little boy to use that word in a sentence. He didn't quite know how to use it, and then he finally used it in this way. He said, I wore out the seat of my trousers by notwithstanding. And after saying all those nice things, he says, notwithstanding or, or but. Despite the love, the faith, and the patient endurance these believers had, they were nonetheless in need of some correct sh correction. And the correction here begins with, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. She claimed to speak for God. This brings to mind, of course, the idolatrous queen who enticed Israel uh, to engage in Baal worship in the book of 1 Kings. The church here tolerated her. The sin of tolerance is the tolerance of sin. She practiced witchcraft, worshiped Baal. She took care of 850 false prophets but put out a contract on the head of the true prophet Elijah. She led Israel into gross immorality and idolatry. And now the evil woman of Revelation 2.20 may have been named Jezebel, or 
that might be a pseudonym or simply Christ's description of her, that she was a Jezebel-like woman. We don't know for sure. But what made her message popular? People asked, can I keep my confession of Christ and still be a member of these trade guilds? See, at these events, at the beginning and end, a sacrifice would be offered to their gods. Then they would eat the meat sacrificed to these gods, to these idols. They often, that often de, um, degraded into drunken revelry and sexual immorality. So the Christians wanted to know, can we continue to go to these guilds and support this in these activities? In Pergamum, remember their lives had been threatened. Here was their livelihood being threatened. So in the first case, their lives were threatened. In this case, they could lose their jobs. They could lose their livelihood. It was hard to make a living in a town without being part of one of these guilds. And so she came up with this progressive theology. It's okay to have both. Uh, you notice there in, in verse 20, she taught and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So this woman promoted the idea that people could engage in sins of the outer body, such as sexual immorality, without, gener without injuring the inner spirit. You think about that. Th they can't. And one of the things you need to remember is when the church received this letter, it was read out loud. It was read to everyone in the congregation. Can you imagine that Jezebel sitting there and when this letter is read, all eyes must, must have turned to her uh, as it was being read. In verse 21, Jesus said, I gave her time to repent of her sex sexual immorality, but she did not repent. God always gives people ample time to repent. Recall that uh, he gave the Ninevites 40 days to repent, which they did, and therefore they averted judgment. Many people hardened their hearts against God, refusing to repent. And that must be what she did here. She just refused. Jesus gave her time, but she refused. And the false prophet Jezebel was hardened against God. She hardened her heart against God. Her time for repentance was over. So verse 22, look, I will throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Now notice the irony here. The woman promoted sexual immorality, a sin committed in a bed. In judgment, she would be thrown in a sick bed. I will throw her into great tribulation. The Greek it literally throw her into great distress. Severe judgment was imminent. Unless they repent, only repentance can avert judgment. There was time left for them to repent, but they had to do it immediately. Verse 23 says, I will put her children to death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds. I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Now, these are not literal offspring but rather is referring to her followers. But nothing escapes God's Christ's notice. He has perfect knowledge of what transpires in every heart. God's judgment is just. It is equal with one's deeds. Those who were her closest followers, they also ran out of time to repent. They were given time themselves to repent and yet they chose not to. And so the command is given in verses 24 and 25. 24, now to I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this teaching, who have not known what some call the depths of Satan, I will put on you no other burden. So not everyone in the church had been unfaithful to the Lord, and he provides a special word there for them. 
The depth of Satan apparently refers to this seductive false teachings that led to eating food sacrificed to idols and then the sexual immorality that followed. And we contrast this, though, with the deep things of God. Verse 25, But hold firmly what you have until I come. Jesus urges these faithful followers to not give up in their resisting evil, to remain intolerant if need be. Believers are to remain faithful until Christ's second coming, at which time he will reward them for their faithfulness. In our pluralistic society, we also must hold firmly to the truth that we have and not compromise it and not um, be guilty of tolerating that which is sinful in God's eyes. We will be rewarded also for our faithfulness when Jesus returns if we hold if we hold on, if we hold firmly. The comfort to them is given in verses 26 through 29. To him who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Faithful believers will reign with Christ during his millennial reign, during his 1,000 year reign upon the earth. And they will have authority to rule and to reign uh, with him. But believers who do not remain faithful apparently forfeit uh, this reign. Verse 27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron like the vessels of a potter. They shall be broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. Josiah Wedgwood uh, was a potter. He would founded the, the Wedgwood Company. He would often walk through his factory in England and he would smash the inferior pieces of poverty, pottery uh, with his walking stick. And he would say, this will not do for Josiah Wedgwood. There is a day coming when Jesus will do the same thing. He's going to come back to this world and he's going to say, uh, that won't do. That won't do for Jesus Christ. And all things that are contrary to him will be removed and smashed. He's going to take uh, back planet earth. He's going to restore paradise in this earth. Thou shalt break them, Psalms 2, 9 and 10 says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's a messianic psalm talking about the second coming of Jesus. But I believe that Jesus is saying to us today, Do not tolerate now what I will not tolerate then. Don't be ruled by a world that is someday going to be ruled by Christ. And we are going to rule and to reign with him. Christ will rule in the millennial kingdom with unbending and relentless righteousness, justice, and equity. He received his authority from the Father, and faithful believers will receive their authority from Christ himself. And then it says, I will give him the morning star, verse 28. Christ himself is the morning star. In Revelation 22 and verse 16, we learn that. And through this morning star, though this morning star has, has already dawned in the hearts of believers, according to Peter in 2 Peter 2, or 1, chapter 1, verse 19, they will one day encounter him directly and in his fullness. Verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, this world is getting to be a very dark place. It's getting very dark. And praise God, because the darkness means the morning star before long is going to appear. And that's Jesus. Jesus is the morning star. And before long, he's going to appear. So don't let go. Don't let down. Don't back up. Don't shut up until you're taken up. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. And he's saying to you and I today, just hold fast. Stand in there. Stick in there. Because one of these days, you will possess that morning star that's going to come. And if you have Jesus, then you have everything. I remember reading a story about a wealthy Roman who had a lavish estate. 
and he had a servant named Marcellus. And when the wealthy Roman died, he wrote his will and left everything to his slave, Marcellus. The wealthy Roman also had a son, and for some reason he had come into disagreement with his son. And so in his will he said, I have left my entire estate to my slave, Marcellus. To my son, I leave him only one thing. He can choose any one thing from my estate he wants, but that's all. And the son said, very well, I choose Marcellus. Now if you choose Jesus, with Jesus comes all the Father's wealth. That would be a wise choice. So here's what the Lord is saying, to him that overcometh, I will give the morning star. Thank you for uh, listening today, and we'll be back soon with the uh, next church in Revelation.